Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our free next-gen NCLEX review. My name is Jackie. Happy Thursday. We're so glad you guys are here. Um, we're going to take just a minute, make sure everything is up and running on all of our social media platforms. So feel free to start using that chat. Let us know where you guys are coming from. We're so glad y'all are here. Um, we have a fun maybe fun to some topic. Uh, we're <laughs> rounding out electrolytes. We're going to talk about sodium, and we're also going to talk about some kind of tough disease processes, which are SI, ADH, and DI. So we'll jump into all of that soon, um, but just give us a quick second. We'll make sure everything's up and running. Um, again, yeah, tell us where you guys are coming from. Um, make sure you use that chat, and we will get started in just a second. Um, just a refresher on our schedule. We are here every Tuesday and Thursday at noon central time. Um, again, today we're talking, we're rounding out electrolytes. Next week, we're gonna be talking about diabetic ketoacidosis and walking through a case study um, and really focusing on that content. So it'll be kind of like a two part thing. So we hope you guys can join us. Um, as always, we're on demand on Facebook and YouTube. So I got the green light. Um, I got the green light, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So I'll officially kick us off here. Again, welcome everybody. My name is Jackie. I work here at UWorld, and we're so glad you guys are here. Um, today we're going to be talking about electrolytes, sodium. Um, we're going to focus on SIADH, uh, which is Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone and Diabetes Insipidus. Um, hello to all of our friends on all of our social media channels. A special note to our friends on TikTok. Make sure you guys share this live recording right now so that you guys can invite your friends, let them know we're talking about the coolest electrolyte of all, sodium, um, and some really fun disease processes. So again, uh, make sure you share. You can always check us out um, on demand as well on Facebook and YouTube. Um, what else do we have? What are our little housekeeping things? Um, we have an agenda for you guys to follow along with today. So if any of you guys are joining late, not that if I'm speaking to you now, you are not joining late, you are on here live. But again, we just have a little map that's going to tell you where we are in our discussion and our conversation. Um, we have kind of three, four topics that we're covering. And so we're going to ask some questions along the way. We'll have questions at the end of our kind of big content breaks and um, go about it that way. So um, I guess without further ado, just make sure and um, use that chat along the way. Let me see who we have here. Oh my goodness. Hello, Abigail coming from Ghana. That is so cool. We have some friends. Elizabeth is saying hello from Nigeria. Hello, Elizabeth. Um, Jamaica, Canada, Columbus, Ohio. You guys are coming from all Canada. We love that. KP, thank you for sharing your video. And hello to our friends in the Philippines. So amazing. So you guys, thank you so much. Um, ooh, San Diego. So nice and sunny. I love the sun emojis on there. Um, all right. Well, again, yeah, feel free to share along the way. We don't want anyone to miss out on our conversation. So we will go ahead and kind of kick this off. So um, again, we are going to be talking about sodium. So starting with our basics of sodium, we're just going to talk through what sodium does, and then we'll talk about hyper and hyponatremia. So sodium is an extracellular electrolyte. It's primarily absorbed in the GI tract, so in our intestine, stomach, and excreted through the kidneys. And there's two kind of primary like cellular processes that happen with sodium, and we're going to walk through those. So the first is the sodium potassium pump, and the second is osmosis. So we're going to break these down for you as simple as possible. So we have an image of a sodium potassium pump that we're going to bring up. And we actually talked about this one on our potassium electrolyte session earlier this month. So feel free to go back and take a look at that. But we'll kind of cover the same information about it. Um, so the sodium potassium pump is a critical protein that's found on the cell membrane. And it's used to create action potential for a cell. And that's pretty much what it's what what it says, it's potential. So essentially, it's slowly preparing the cell so it can do its job. So the sodium potassium pump is responsible for creating this action potential for a cell, for cell membranes. So kind of think of the pump like this. It's going to open to the inside of the cell first. It's going to grab three sodium ions, which are positively charged ions. Then the pump is like, great, I've got a full crowd of sodiums. I'm going to push you guys outside the cell, and I'm going to pick up two 
potassium. So the pump then picks up two potassium ions from the bloodstream. It pushes them inside the cell. Potassium is also a positively charged ion. So the thing that's really cool about this and what's a little bit different is that sodium, uh, the sodium and potassium bump forces these electrolytes into a space where there is a higher concentration. So it has to use energy or ATP to do this. So sodium is moving from lower concentrations in the cell to higher concentrations in the cell. So it's swimming upstream and potassium is moving from lower concentrations outside the cell to higher concentrations inside the cell. So all of this together is called active transport. So the biggest takeaway to take from this is that exchange of sodium and potassium. It's important when it comes to influencing muscle function. So we need these ions to move in and out of the cell to get our muscles to work correctly. And when we think muscles, we need to think cardiac muscles, skeletal muscles, and our smooth muscles in our GI tract. Okay, so that's the sodium potassium pump. We have another image we're gonna bring up to kind of give you a visual of osmosis. So, um, and just kind of follow along with me for this osmosis explanation. But essentially, osmotic pressure controls the fluid movement um, that we have in our cells. So in the image that you guys can see, the jar on the left has a hypotonic solution on the left, a semi-permeable membrane in the middle, and a hypertonic solution on the right. So over time, you can see that fluid is going to shift through the membrane. So the ratio of solutes, which are those little green guys on there, to the solution or fluid is going to equal. So fluid is shifting from low concentration to high concentration, or hypotonic to hypertonic. Okay, so those are kind of like our basics of sodium that we need to know before we talk about hypernatremia and hyponatremia. So we're going to kick things off with hypernatremia. So just breaking down the word, hypernatremia. So hyper means high, nat is like sodium, and emia means blood. So we have high sodium in the blood. Okay, so hypernatremia happens at levels greater than 145 milliequivalents per liter or 145 millimoles per liter. Um, so when we have high sodium in our blood, again, remember, it's an extracellular electrolyte. So those fundamental concepts of osmosis are going to kick in, and the sodium is going to pull fluid from lower concentrations to higher concentrations. And this is especially bad when it happens in our brain. So so high serum sodium levels are going to pull water from brain cells where there is a low concentration of sodium into cerebral veins where there is a high concentration of sodium. So this fluid shift is going to cause our uh, the veins to enlarge and rupture, and that is very bad news. That is not good news for our brain. So before we kind of get a little bit more into that, we're going to talk about causes of hyponatremia. So we've covered the path though of hypernatremia. We're going to talk about the causes of hypernatremia. So I want you guys, before we get into all those details, I want you guys to picture a perfect glass of water that has just the right amount of water and the right amount of salt in it. So it's perfectly balanced. Um, in hypernatremia, either the body is going to be gaining too much sodium or losing too much water. So bringing it back to our glass of water. Either that perfect glass of water is going to get a bunch of salt like dumped into it, or fluid is going to come out and that salt is going to remain or stay behind. So some examples of that excessive sodium intake or shaking salt into our glass of water can include like administration of hypertonic saline or IV sodium bicarbonate. These are highly concentrated with sodium in them, so that can cause us to become hypernatremic. On the flip side, decreased sodium excretion would happen with conditions that affect our kidneys like acute or chronic kidney disease. It's also seen with hyperaldosteronism. So this is a condition that affects our adrenal glands. So our adrenal glands sit on top of our kidneys. So aldosterone is a hormone that is important in sodium retention. So they move together in the same direction. So if we have increased aldosterone, or hyperaldosteronism, hyper we're going to have increased sodium or hypernatremia. So we kind of covered the sodium parts of hypernatremia, either taking too much in or excreting too little out. Um, so let's talk about our fluid balance now and how we can cause relative hypernatremia. 
So inadequate, inadequate water intake and excessive water loss can lead to hypernatremia. So kidney disease um, and hyperaldosteronism, again, we, we've talked about those things. So, um, oh, you know what? I got a little off on my notes here. <laughs> um, we've covered all of those. Let's see, let me get to where we are. So let's talk about fluid losses. Okay, so inadequate water intake can occur in clients that are unconscious. So again, hyper kidney disease and hyperaldosteronism are shaking salt, making our water saltier. The next situations are about removing water and making that normal water now salty water. So again, um, inadequate water intake can occur in clients that are unconscious or cognitively impaired or clients that are experiencing prolonged fasting. Um, there's also things like pulling fluid out of the body like uh, diarrhea and vomiting. And maybe some more obvious examples are instances where moisture is leaving our body, like through sweating or hyperventilating. Um, last but not least, diabetes insipidus, which we're going to talk about just a little bit later. That's another thing that can cause this. Um, so just remember that we're going to come back to it. Okay, so we covered causes of hypernatremia. Let's cover manifestations now. So what hypernatremia looks like. We are going to look and act salty. So think about our brain. Our brain is going to be salty. Um, early symptoms of hypernatremia can include like lethargy, weakness, and irritability. So irritable, think salty. Um, Symptoms can progress to like muscle twitching, our muscles will be salty. And again, when we say muscles, think your heart and your brain. So if our brain is twitchy or our brain is salty, our brain is irritable, we worry about seizures and we worry about coma. So other ways we can look salty, think about dehydration. So this can look like dry mucous membranes, um, increased thirst, decreased urination. And then to compensate for dehydration, we're gonna have an increased heart rate and de uh, to compensate for a decreased circulating fluid volume. Okay, so how are we going to treat this? Let's talk about nursing interventions for hypernatremia. So I, I've, if you've been listening to any of these electrolyte videos, I'm definitely gonna sound like a broken record, but we have to collect baseline um, information on our electrolytes and we have to monitor where we're going. So again, um, we have to collect our baseline information about where our sodium level is and we're gonna collect repeat levels as we're treating our client. We also want to document our hourly intake and output and make Make sure what is going in and coming out is making sense for our situation. Um, we want to encourage the client to increase their oral fluid intake and decrease their sodium intake. So again, these clients are salty. We want to dilute the sodium. We may also give them hypotonic fluids or um, 0.45% sodium chloride or half normal saline, um, or even give them isotonic solutions, which would just be our traditional normal saline or 0.9% um, sodium chloride. So um, when we're giving fluids though, we have to be sure that we're decreasing the sodium level slowly. So if we cause abrupt or sudden shifts in the sodium, we can actually cause cerebral edema and that can cause permanent neurological complications. So a, a, essentially what's happening is our brain swells to the point of like no return. So again, our brain is salty, we have a risk of seizures, so we're gonna need to put our client on seizure precautions. All right. We covered hypernatremia. We're now gonna move on to hyponatremia. So I also wanna let you guys know, if you have questions along the way, we have our nursing experts monitoring the chat. So feel free to ask questions. They're there for you guys, they're there to answer them. And then we'll review some of this content as a group right after we get through hyponatremia. Okay, so hyponatremia. We're going to break down the word again. Hypo means low. Nat means sodium, uh, emia means blood. So we have low sodium in our blood. So hyponatremia is going to happen at levels less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. And this can happen, uh, or 135 millimoles per liter. And this can happen in two ways. So we either have too little sodium or we have um, too much water. So again, let's think about our perfect glass of water. We're either going to dilute the water with more water um, or salt is going to leave the water and leave the water behind. So we're going to start with excess sodium loss, which would fall under too little sodium, our too little sodium situation. 
So again, remembering back to our sodium basics, it's absorbed in our GI tract. So when we think about causes of hyponatremia, we should think about GI losses like diarrhea, vomiting, NG tube suction, anything coming up or down from our stomach. Okay, and knowing now that sodium is excreted through the kidneys, we need to think about renal losses of sodium through excessive fluid loss, like with diuretics or adrenal insufficiency. Okay, so we talked about aldosterone, aldosterone and aldo hyperaldosteronism and sodium moving in the same direction as aldosterone. So hyperaldosteronism or increased secretion of aldosterone from the adrenal glands, again, caused increased sodium. The opposite is true for hyponatremia. So adrenal insufficiency or insufficient aldosterone is going to lead to sodium loss through the kidneys. Um, other causes can be burns. So our skin is so critical for holding moisture and electrolytes and when that barrier is compromised we're going to lose sodium and we're going to lose other electrolytes and even fluid through our skin so this is why when we're treating for burns that fluid resuscitation is so important okay so other um some other more sodium focused causes we're going to kind of flip um, to the fluid so again those are sodium related causes we're going to flip to fluid related causes so in hyponatremia those are um all about excess water gain so if we're starting with our regular water this is just the right amount of salt and water if we add a bunch of water to our solution we're going to dilute that salt concentration so this is called relative or dilutional hyponatremia so some examples of these might be like hypotonic iv fluid administration so um, having too much half normal saline polydipsia or drinking too much fluid cirrhosis so when our liver is so impaired that it begins to affect our kidney function that can lead to hyponatremia um, heart failure where we have fluid build up in our vascular space this can dilute the sodium in our blood and SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone um, which we're going to talk about later again this is all related to hyponatremia okay we covered causes of hyponatremia. Let's cover manifestations of hyponatremia. So what will our client look like? So the movement of fluid from the intravascular space to the extravascular space and eventually, eventually into the cell or the intracellular space is going to cause these cells to swell. So just like in hypernatremia, our symptoms are all going to be neurologic, but our brain is not salty this time. Our brain is going to be kind of like blah and bland and not, not, um, as salty. <laughs> so when that fluid shifts into cells, our brain is really most effective because it has the like tightest space constraints um, due to our skull. So if fluid is shifting into the cells and those cells expand in our brain, it can only expand very little before we're going to start seeing complications or before problems start to kind of like arise. So think of cerebral edema, which we know looks like headache, nausea, that projectile vomiting, lethargy, confusion, and again, seizures. Anything that kind of messes with our perfectly balanced brain is going to lead to seizures and even coma. So again, this is kind of going to look similar to our findings associated with hypernatremia. Anything that's messing with our brain is going to lead to seizures. Okay, so how do we treat hyponatremia? Let's talk about nursing interventions. So again, collecting that baseline information, we're gonna monitor our levels. We're just gonna say it over and over again. It's never wrong. <laughs> um, we wanna document our intake and output to make sure what's going in and coming out is making sense for our situation. Um, again, our brain is sensitive with sodium, so we need to put the client on seizure precautions. We talked all about this. Um, so what are we going, um, how are we going to treat the cause? So if hyponatremia is from sodium loss or insufficient sodium, um, intake we're going to replace sodium either orally with salt tablets or um, like IV solutions um, but if our hyponatremia is dilutional from too much water we're going to put the client on a fluid restriction and we're going to give them loop diuretics that's going to start pulling that fluid out so just how we had um, lower sodium level or 
just how we had to lower sodium levels slowly with hypernatremia, we need to raise sodium levels slowly with hyponatremia. So anything we do with sodium, think our brain, we need to be gentle on our brain. It's, we have to act slowly. So if we um, correct the sodium level too quickly, a condition called osmotic demyelin demyelin demyelination <laughs> syndrome can occur, and that can cause permanent damage to the brain. So essentially what happens is that osmotic fluid shift from the um, different concentrations is going to shrink our cells and the myelin sheath on our nerves is going to be damaged. So our cells are no longer going to be able to communicate with each other. So this is not good news, definitely bad news. That's why we wanna do this very slowly. Okay, we're gonna pause there. I'm gonna check in with the chat. I want you guys to drop something that you learned about hypo or hypernatremia that maybe you didn't know before or something that maybe is sticking with you in the chat. So it could be anything from like causes, manifestations, treatment. Um, let us know which what you think, um, if you can remember, if DI went with hyper or hyponatremia, if SIADH went with hyper or hyponatremia. Again, we have our people, or a team of experts on there that are monitoring and we will um, look at all this information and see what you guys are saying. Um, so we'll see what you guys have. Again, we're just doing a quick break, a little knowledge check. I'm curious to see what you guys are pulling from the chat. Awesome, very good. <clears throat> All right, I'm seeing some things come in about SIEDH and hypernatremia, hyponatremia. Very good, you guys. Let's see what else have we got. Good job to our friends on Facebook. That is so great. Good work, you guys. Brain is salty and hypernatremia. Very good on Instagram. Good job. All right, we're going to keep on going. All right. So we have covered sodium. We're now going to talk about SIEDH. So um, we'll pull up our agenda. So if anyone has just joined, we're now talking about SIEDH. We just covered sodium and how sodium works in our body. Um, and we're gonna talk about SIEDH now. It's not too late to share um, our live if you guys are on TikTok, so feel free to share. So again, let's start with SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormones. So again, this is all going to relate to these um, findings associated with um, hyper and hyponatremia. Okay, so breaking down these words. Syndrome of inappropriate um, means not the right amount of ADH or antidiuretic hormone. So inappropriate can mean either excessive, like way too much antidiuretic hormone being released, or it's releasing at the wrong time at inappropriate times. So let's get to the kind of root of what ADH is. So it is a hormone that is released by the pituitary gland. So our pituitary gland releases ADH when there is a decrease in the level of circulating volume in our blood vessels. So when our blood volume gets low, it's kind of like an alarm goes off in our body and all the doors shut to our body. Um, so the body, our, the doors of our body close and no fluid can escape. So the pituitary gland is then going to send these little ADH guys to our kidneys and tell the kidneys, you guys have to send water back to our body. Um, the, so they're gonna send these ADH to the kidneys, tell the kidneys that they need to send water back into our blood vessels um, instead of through the urinary tract. So this is very unscientific, but if you can just think of it that way, too much ADH, our body's gonna stop secreting fluid, it's going to send it all back into our blood vessels. So again, ADH is going to um, be sure we're retaining fluid instead of excreting it. And this is going to lead to water retention or increased total water, uh, total body water and dilutional hyponatremia. So yes, we already know about this. So um, 
we, we've just talked about hyponatremia. Okay, so what causes SIEDH? So any CNS disturbances near the pituitary gland, like stroke, bleed, or hemorrhage, or even trauma can cause this. And the leader of like our ADH, so like when our pituitary gland is impaired, like the leader of our ADH team is confused and like does not know what's going on. So anything with the pituitary gland can cause um, SIDH. So other medications like SSRIs or um, carbamazepine, like those kind of medications, or even lung disease or lung cancer, specifically small cell lung cancer, can cause an increase in ADH. So in lung cancer, this happens because those malignant cells produce ADH outside of the pituitary gland. Um, so we've kind of covered the patho of SIEDH. Let's talk about manifestations of SIEDH or what our client will look like. So this is all related to too much ADH. So again, remember the doors are shut, no water is getting out. So what does that look like? It's going to look like low urine output. So again, the doors are shut, the fluid is stuck in our body. It's going to look like weight gain. So water is heavy. We're going to have uh, water retention. We're going to have hypertension. We have increased Circulating, circulating fluid volume, and we're going to have hyponatremia. Um, so again, remember, this is dilutional hyponatremia. So we once had the perfect combo of salt and water, and now we are flooding that with all this extra water from all the ADH, that um, the little ADH guys that are telling our kidneys to send the fluid back into our body. So again, this is going to look like a blah brain, like a hyponatremic client. So when that fluid shifts into the cells, our brain is most affected because it has the tightest space constraints due to our skull. So fluid shifts and cells expand in our brain. It can only, again, expand very little before problems start to arise. So think of cerebral edema, which we know looks like headache, nausea, vomiting, lethargy, confusion, seizures, all that, even coma. So let's talk a little bit about labs. So we are going to look at the blood versus the urine. So levels that will be low um, when we, we're going to talk about like, we're going to break it up labs that are low, labs that are high. Labs that are low are going to be what is in our blood. So what is in our blood is going to be low because remember, we are retaining all that water in our blood. It's going to be diluted or hypo or low. So we're going to have low serum osmolality. We're going to have hypotonic blood. We're going to have low serum sodium. Again, we have dilutional hyponatremia and we're going to have low urine urine volume. Again, the doors are shut, no urine is getting out. So levels that will be high is everything in our urine. So what will be in our urine will be high. So again, what comes out of our urine has kind of like defied the odds of the disease process of SIEDH. So it's going to be super concentrated. Um, no fluid is really supposed to be getting out. So what is getting out is going to have a lot in it. So we're going to have a high urine specific gravity and a high urine osmolality. So we're going to have hypertonic urine. So we're going to have hypo tonic blood, hypertonic urine, if that helps you remember it. Okay. So we covered causes and manifestations. Let's talk about nursing interventions for SIADH. So how are we going to care for these clients? So we're going to focus on opening the doors and tucking our ADHs away. <laughs> so the big med to remember for SIADH is tolvaptin, which is a vasopressin antagonist. So it's going to block ADH. So ADH is our whole problem. We have too much of it. We need a Put it back in its place. So um, that medication, any type of uh, vasopressin antagonist is going to be what we want to give these clients. Mild SIADH can be treated maybe even with just a fluid restriction, so less than 800 milliliters a day. We might also give diuretics to correct our water retention, so get that fluid out. Um, we can also replenish sodium with oral salt tablets or hypertonic saline. And then again, same principles for what we talked about before. We want to monitor these clients' daily weights, and we want to monitor their intake and output. Um, so again, since our brain is blah, <laughs> we want to perform frequent neuro checks, make sure we're headed in the right direction, and we want to implement seizure precautions. So we have a question we're going to bring up just to check our learning on SIEDH. So I will read it to you guys and then feel free to answer. I'll let you guys take some time to answer and then I will um, walk through it with you. 
Um, so we'll pull it up and I will get to reading. Okay. So the nurse is caring for a client with syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone or SIEDH. Which of the following actions should the nurse take? Select all that apply. So option one, administer vasopressin. Option two, implement seizure precautions. Option three, perform frequent neuro checks. Option four, keep a strict record of fluid intake and output. And option five, maintain an IV infusion of 0.9% sodium chloride. So I will let you guys take a minute to answer in the chat. Again, this is a select all that apply. So we will have more than one right answer. Let's see what we got. Seeing a lot of answers come in from YouTube and Facebook. Let's see what we got. Good job, Melena. Good job, uh, Bacheva. Um, let's see what we got. Eliza, good job. Oh, I think I clicked it. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Lid oh, I, these are going so fast. I cannot keep up with it. Oh, I'm clicking the wrong ones. You guys are doing great. <laughs> I, I appreciate the, um, quickness of your replies. I am too slow to keep up with them. Good job, you guys. Way to go. All right. Okay, so we'll start walking through it. So, okay, so again, we're talking about SADH. Um, option one, administer vasopressin. So vasopressin is synthetic ADH. We don't want to do this. We don't want to give our client more ADH. We already have an inappropriate amount of ADH. We have too much ADH. So this is actually like a spoiler alert. This is what we would do for DI. Um, so that is not our correct answer. Option two, implement seizure precautions. Correct, we definitely wanna do this. Again, our brain is blah. We need to protect our brain, uh, or we need to protect our client from any abnormal brain activity. Uh, option three, same idea. Our brain is blah, we need to perform frequent neurological checks. We need to make sure um, that we're not having anything adverse happen or heading in the wrong direction. Option four, keep a strict I and O. True, we need to do this. Um, we need to make sure that our body is, um, that our fluid intake is matching up, that everything is looking right. Um, option five, maintain an IV infusion of 0.9% sodium chloride. Um, this is not appropriate in SIADH. It causes water retention. Um, our treatment needs to focus on reducing fluid volume. All right. You guys did good. I saw a lot of right answers. I think that vasopressin was tricky for you guys. You want a vasopressin antagonist. So that's, um, this was like a distractor. So this is a treatment for DI. Okay. So we're gonna move on to our last topic. We'll check back in with our agenda. We're gonna talk about diabetes insipitus now, which is our last topic for the day, and we have one more question after this. Okay, so we need to just think about diabetes insipitus as the opposite of SIADH. So if SIADH is too much ADH, DI is not enough ADH. So in SIADH, the ADH <laughs> locked up our body, didn't let water out. The opposite happens with DI, and we have excessive urination. So I did a little digging for you guys. I looked up what diabetes and insipitus mean in Latin because I don't really feel like the words are very telling of like what's happening in our situation here. So diabetes means to siphon or to pass through, and insipitus means tasteless. So this might be a stretch, but I think it's what it, I think it ties it all together. But essentially, when we think of tasteless, we think of water. Water is tasteless. We, when we know now that diabetes means to pass through, we're passing a bunch of tasteless water. So that's what's happening with DI. We have a lot of dilute urine that's coming out of the body. So I hope that works for you guys. Again, if it doesn't, just do my best for you guys here. Okay, so there's two different types of diabetes insipidus. There is central and there's nephrogenic. We're gonna mainly talk about central di uh, diabetes insipidus, but we'll touch on nephrogenic um, a little bit as well. So central DI happens when we have decreased um, ADH secretion. So again, ADH is made in the hypothalamus and secreted by the pituitary gland. When the pituitary gland is altered or damaged, we can have decreased ADH secretion. So things that can cause this include like trauma to the pituitary gland from surgery or stroke. 
and then nephrogenic DI, the other type of DI. This happens from um, ADH resistance by the kidneys, and it's usually from like external factors like medications, um, like lithium or hypercalcemia, or it can even be just hereditary in general. Okay, so that's some of our patho. Let's talk about manifestations or what DI looks like. So what our client with DI is gonna look like. Okay, so again, remembering back to my um, very scientific interpretation of diabetes and insipitus, we're going to pass through a lot of the tasteless, which we're insane, we're passing a lot of water. So our client is going to look like someone who is urinating a lot, a lot of urination and a lot of a lot of water. So the client is going to have very dilute pale urine. Um, they're going to be dehydrated from all of this passing of urine. So they're going to have tachycardia to compensate from that decreased circulating uh, water volume. They're going to have hypotension. Again, we don't have as much fluid fluid on our body, diminished pulses, our blood is not going to be making its way to our peripheral pulses as well, and dry mucous membranes, again, dehydration. They're going to have insomnia because they're urinating so much. Um, their labs are going to be off. So again, how we kind of talked about high and low blood and urine with um, SIADH, we're going to do the same thing with DI. So our labs that are going to be high in DI is going to be our blood. So we're going to have increased sodium, serum sodium. So water is leaving, salt is staying behind. We have increased serum osmolality. Again, sodium and osmolality go together. That's all about the solutes and the concentration. We're going to have hypertonic blood. We're going to have increased urine volume. So again, it says it in its name. That's what DI is. So our levels that are low is going to be what's in our urine. So again, the urine, the specific gravity of our urine is going to be low. It's going to be mostly water, not a lot of salt. Um, so I hope that's helpful for you guys. Um, again, we, so we covered patho and manifestations. Last part is treatment. So we're just going to focus on central DI here. So first, we're going to administer desmopressin to replace our low ADH. So again, desmopressin is synthetic ADH, almost as good as the original, but we're going to give that to promote the renal water reabsorption. So we want that fluid to come back into our body and not out through our urinary system. Um, again, this is going to promote renal water reabsorption. So sending water back to our bloodstream, it's going to reduce our urine output. We might also administer hypotonic IV fluids like 0.5% sodium chloride or half normal saline. Um, again, the objective of this is to replace that fluid loss, restore our plasma osmolality. Because we are a little salty from that salt that's staying behind, um, we need to reduce that serum sodium again. So we're going to move, um, we're gonna have more salt than water with DI. So again, we want to administer fluid. Um, we want to collect daily weights to make sure that our client is, um, their weight is again trending in the right direction. They're losing a lot of water weight. We want to make sure that they're able to retain that fluid again. And we want to make sure intake and output reflect our, our outcome again. So we want to make sure those numbers are lining up, that we're not having these major losses again. So again, um, just to recap, like if I could give you just the bite-sized amounts of all of this, in SIADH, we're going to have hypotonic blood and we're going to have hypertonic urine. So in SIADH, again, the doors are shut. There's too much fluid in our body where that our blood, our serum is going to be very diluted and what's coming out in our urine is going to be very concentrated. In DI, it's the opposite. We have hypertonic blood because all that fluid is leaving in our urine, so we're going to have hypotonic urine. So again, our blood is very concentrated, very salty. Our urine is it's very diluted, very unsalty. <laughs> um, okay, so that was it for DI. We have one last question, and then we will wrap things up. So this question is the DI is about diabetes insipidus, and I will read it for you guys, and then you guys can take some time to answer, um, and we will do that, and then we're almost done. Okay. So the question says, the nurse has attended a staff education program about diabetes insipidus. The nurse should recognize that which of the following procedures may increase a client's risk for developing DI. Option one, radiologic imaging of the head. Option two, partial pancreatic. Oh, I should have practiced saying this word, pancreatectomy. <laughs> uh, option three, cholecystectomy. Option four, neurosurgery. So I'm gonna check the chat, see what you guys think. 
And let's see what we got again. We are wondering about diabetes insipidus. What can cause it? And let's see what you guys have. You guys are doing great. These topics are so hard. That's why this was called Tough Topics. <laughs> um, this is a single best, so we're just going to have one right answer. I'm not even going to try and click these because I'm, I'm not fast enough, but I will do my little shout outs here. But um, John Lucas, option four, sparkling, option four. Good job, you guys. Let's see. Good work. YouTube. Good job. Oh, so fast. Okay. I see one. Good job. Instagram, option four. I'm seeing these come through. Jade on TikTok, option four. Good job, you guys. All right. You're getting it. Very, very good. Okay, so we'll go through these. So um, again, we're talking about DI. We uh, know this is all because of um, uh, uh, ADH in our brain. It happens in our pituitary glands. So option one, radio radiologic imaging of the head. So again, this is going to give us imaging of the head. It's not going to be a cause of DI, but it's headed in the right direction. We're worried about our pituitary glands. So not a right answer. Um, option two, partial pancreatectomy. So again, this is when we remove our pancreas. The pancreas is important for a lot of other hormones, but not for ADH, so not our, not our one. Um, option three, cholecystectomy. That's our uh, removal of our gallbladder. Not gonna be a cause of uh, DI in this situation, but um, it's, it, it's an option. <laughs> and then option four is um, neurosurgery. This is our correct answer. Um, remember, we talked about anything that can inhibit that pituitary gland. That is um, going to send these messages um, that are important for our ADH secretion from our adrenal glands. So again, um, neurosurgery is our correct answer. Anything that's impairing kind of the messenger for our ADH is going to be a cause for DI. So I hope that was helpful to you guys. I know electrolytes are hard. SADH and DI are, DI are very, very hard, but if you can just kind of break it down into like hyper hypotonic blood urine, I hope that helps you guys think about that water you know, water and salt, what's salty, what's um, diluted. And hopefully that can kind of paint the right picture for you guys. So that's all we have for today. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you for being a part of this. As always, we love to say, just come check us out at nursing.uworld.com. We have tons and tons of resources for you guys. There's a free seven day trial you guys can check out. Um, make sure you subscribe and follow UWorld Nursing on all of your fa favorite social media channels. We have a great lineup of topics that are coming coming to you every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, so again, come back next week. We're going to talk about diabetic ketoacidosis, and we're going to walk through a case study together um, on Thursday. So come back. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks for sticking with us, and we'll see you next time. Bye.